I want to thank you, Father, for all of 2018. You didn't let go of me. Some tough stuff happened. Some painful stuff happened. Some difficult things happened. But you wouldn't let go. I must confess that I gave up a couple of times. I lost my way, but you wouldn't let go. Glory! And therefore, you are worthy today of majesty, dominion, power, riches, authority. It all belongs to you. I just want to thank you for letting me get this close to 2019. You didn't have to do it, but you're a prayer answering God, a faithful God, a compassionate God, a merciful God, a relational God, and I say thank you. When I look back over my life and I look back over 2018, uh, time would not allow me to just say how much I thank you for all that you've done. If I had 10,000 tongues, I couldn't thank you enough for all that you've done. And then today, Lord, when I woke up, I was in my right mind. I had the activity of my limbs. had a reasonable portion of health and strength. There was food on my table, clothes on my back. I had a roof over my head. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you are worthy to be praised today. And so I don't want to miss this last opportunity on a Sunday to give you praise. Now take complete control of all that goes on today. Open our hearts and minds to a fresh revelation of your word. We recognize today that there are many in the world who are suffering but thank you that you are a suffering God who brings suffering inside of yourself so that you might answer it and serve those people who are having that kind of difficulty. We place it in your hands. Whatever is accomplished, we'll say yes to your will in the mighty name of Jesus. We do pray and give thanks. If you're not ashamed, go ahead and shout praise God, praise God. and amen. amen. All right, on your way down, tell somebody I'm glad I made it this far. Today as we come to the last Sunday of 2018, I display my plotting nature by returning to and finishing the sermon series that was interrupted several times this year. I plod because I am, through the power of the Holy Ghost, following in the footsteps of God Almighty, who is the ultimate plotter. One Testament, Old Testament scholar, Terence E. Fretheim, who I'm reading right now, and I'm telling you, he is about to blow me away writes in a collection of essay, essays entitled, What Kind of God? God's steadfastness has to do with his love. God's faithfulness has to do with his promises of salvation. And God's will has to do with desiring that people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So God inexorably plods towards love. He inexorably plods towards promises of salvation. And he inexorably, untiringly, it plods toward desiring people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We just got through singing, he won't let go of me. And that means that when I mess up and when I fall out and when I'm having difficulty, he keeps on plodding towards keeping me, holding on to me, and he won't let go of me. As I'm reading the text of the Old Testament right now and studying uh, again and again, I see that there is a God there, God Yahweh, who seems like that when he makes a commitment to enter into a relationship with him, he just ain't got sense enough to quit. He just keeps on being there for us, no matter how messed up we are. He won't give up. He comes back another way, even though we have messed up and fallen and done all kinds of stuff. He doesn't say, you know, I'm tired of you. I'm done with you. But he picks another way and he comes back again. He's a relational God. And so I plod in his image towards completing 
this series on the scandal of the cross to demonstrate God's love, faithfulness, and loving desire for our salvation. Is there anything more central to Christianity than the cross? And yet the cross has been turned into a piece of jewelry that is shocking. If you are wearing a cross, please don't be embarrassed or hide it because it is not you who has done this, but society. Consider for a moment that the French would turn the instrument of torture during their revolution, a guillotine, into a piece of jewelry. That would certainly seem incongruous and inappropriate. Nevertheless, one of the cruelest instruments of human torture, the cross, has been turned into jewelry. And as I read The Scandalous God, The Use and Abuse of the Cross by Vitor Westhill, and then another book called The Cross and Human Transformation by Alexandra Brown, I became more and more aware of the scandal of the cross. What is the scandal of the cross. Well, we get a glimpse of that scandal in one of the new, uh, early New Testament writings of Galatians 5 and 11 in your notes, please. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being cursed, persecuted? The stum then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. The phrase stumbling block is the Greek word scandalon. And according to the New American Exhaustive Concordance, it means a stick for bait, a trap, a snare a stumbling block, an offense. We get the word scandal from it. I believe the program is no longer on TV. Some of y'all are hurting then. And you don't get a chance to see scandal anymore. But that's uh, where we, the word comes up in our vocabulary and our culture. It is in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 2 that Paul explores the scandal of the cross. Well, that was so deep, but I just need to finish it up, plod my way on out as, a, as an example for what you need to do to finish some stuff in 2018. In the first nine messages, we explored the first chapter of 1 Corinthians and the first 13 verses of second chapter of 1 Corinthians. Finally, we move on to 1 Corinthians 2, 14. If it is convenient for you to stand to honor the word of God, we would invite you to do so. If it is not, it's okay. Remember, I just had hip replacement surgery, so I know everybody can't stand. But if you can, it's all right. If you can't, raise your hand, wave, say amen, or whatever you do. But a natural man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. On your way down, touch somebody and say, you got to get a little bit more lively than that. It's the last Sunday of the year. It's the last Sunday of the year. Look alive. Look alive. Look like you're, like you're not dying. Come on, wake up. It's the last chance you get in church on a Sunday morning. In the preceding verses, Paul discusses the mysteries of the cross, which could only be understood through the revelatory ministry of the Holy Ghost. This adds to the scandal of the cross. This repels those who are dependent upon human wisdom, style, and entertainment. It draws those who desire to know God through Jesus and the revelatory power of the Holy Ghost. Remember, you wouldn't remember because it's been so long ago, but try to remember that Paul had just talked about combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. When he moves to his next thought through the conjunction but, but is used to connect two statements that express opposite ideas. But as opposed to the last statement, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. The Greek word translated natural is a very interesting word. It is the word sukikos. It means of or belonging to the breath. It is related to the animal life that is within us. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, I'm an animal. I see some of y'all wouldn't do that. You didn't want to, you wouldn't want to do it. I saw you, I saw you looking there. I'm, I ain't saying that. You are an animal. It is related to the animal life. 
It is the sensuous nature that is due to appetites and passions. Paul is not using a modern psychological term, but describing the functions of people from ancient Hebrew spiritual perspective. The natural person here is an unsaved person. The natural person is driven by his appetite or her appetites and passions. Rene Girard and Jean-Michel Aurelian teach that in the Garden of Eden there was no desire until Satan entered the picture. Before that, Adam and Eve had only human instincts and physical needs that were met fully by God and by each other. They were fully satisfied in God and fully satisfied with each other. And so Adam and Eve were in love with each other and their needs were fully met by God the Father. When Satan came up on the scene and suggested to Eve that she ought to desire to be like God and to know the difference between good and evil and all of a sudden mimetic or imitative desire entered into humanity and Adam and Eve became jealous of what they believed God was holding back from them and God became an obstacle to their happiness rather than the Father who had given them all of these wonderful gifts. They fell from the wonderful, fulfilling personal relationship with God the Father to angry antagonists against God. I'm going to get into trouble here today. It's going to be difficult, but I'm going to do the best I can on this last Sunday to extricate myself, get out, run home, eat, and leave you all alone. You need to understand that it, I, I, don't, I don't want you to raise your hand, but those of you who are married, if you can remember back to when you first got married and you were so in love and you didn't think that there was anybody else in the world except you and your mate. You were fully satisfied in God and with your mate, not looking at anybody else, not considering anybody else. You thought you were in paradise. You thought you were in Eden. What had happened? You were there and then something took place and you walked up out of paradise into the reality of a world, a different reality. And I'm going to tell you what happened today so you'll know the devil showed up. And when you allowed the devil in your relationship, instead of you gathering together against him, you allowed him to divide and conquer you. And from that point until now, God has been working the mysterious plan to restore the fellowship that Adam and Eve lost. Those who have not accepted Jesus as their personal savior are natural. They are driven by appetites and passions. It is these appetites and passions that create accusations, blame, rivalry, and violence. I'm talking about unsaved people governed by their passions, governed by their appetite, who cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God. Now, it's going to get tight in here today because some of you, even though you say you are saved, you are still governed by your passions. You can't, uh, uh, you let your passions govern you rather than you govern them. I mean, when you say uh, cherry ice cream comes upon you, you just can't resist. And wait a minute now, if you want to have you some cherry ice cream, go ahead. But when the ice cream has you, and you can't stop when your foot cannot be controlled and you can't stay under the speed limit. When your appetites and passions drive you, I'm all by myself. I thought it'd be kind of quiet because we can't tell the saved from the unsaved right now. As we leave 2018, we do not want to be driven by appetites and passions that arise from seeing God as a rival or an obstacle because you can't get God to do what you want him to do. He's not acting the way you think he ought to act. You cannot manipulate him into getting what you, your passions and your desires. It leaves us with a powerful question. Why can't a natural person accept the things that are revealed by the Spirit. I'm in the text, y'all. That is the text. Well, a natural or unsaved person can accept the things that are revealed by the Spirit because they are foolishness to him. Now, I got to go back for them, them, them other sermons way back there that we've forgotten. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved. It is the power of God. Unsaved people find things of the Spirit foolish some of us walking around thinking you're talking to unsaved people and they like what you're saying it's foolish in addition the natural unsaved person cannot understand the things of the spirit because they're confusing and finally the things of the spirit are foolish and can't be understood by natural or unsaved people because they are spiritually appraised 
The word appraised here means to sifting, like a sifting process, to get at the truth by investigating something. The Bereans uh, investigated, scrutinized the scriptures to see whether those things were so. You can call this spiritual discernment. We don't have much of it anymore. Frethine, the Old Testament scholar, wrote and said, God is a master of discernment, seeing what is needed and acting in a way that fits the needs of the moment. We are coming from an ontological Greek perspective, looking at who God is in his essence and listening to Aristotle saying that God is the unmoved mover. But Abraham Heschel, the Hebrew scholar, said that God is the most moved mover. He's not the unmoved mover. He is in a relationship with us and he has the ability to discern in the moment how he needs to respond to each one of us after we have made certain choices in our lives. I'm, I'm not getting no help here because the God I'm talking about is omnicompetent. Talk, touch somebody and say, what he, what he, what he say? What, what he say? He's omnicompetent. You can't do nothing that would, that would mess God up so that he's not competent to be able to handle whatever it is that you are throwing at him and whatever it is that you are doing. You can be as messed up as you want to be. God ain't messed up. He knows where you are and he knows how to respond in the moment. He is a, a master of discernment to know how to know exactly where you are and respond to it. That's because he's got a genuine relationship with you. Now, this goes against all of the traditional uh, perspectives of God that we have, that he is uh, unchanging, unmoving, um, that he is controlling, um, um, that he is all of these judgmental and all. But if you read the text, you will see that that's not who he is. Early on in the text, Abraham has got a voice, and Abraham has got power, and he's arguing with God and interacting with God, and God's responding. God doesn't say, if he, like you would say, he would just tell Abraham, look, I got this. Don't ask me no questions. But he's asking the question, says, should I talk to Abraham? Maybe I ought to tell him what I'm about to do. Because I think we're going to have to let some judgment fall over here. But if we talk to Abraham, Abraham going to want to get involved. He's going to have some stuff to say. They say, well, let's go on and tell him. Because uh, that's, uh, Abraham starts talking to God. Are y'all are hearing me here? And he starts talking to God and says, listen now, God, I know you wouldn't want to destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. You're not that kind of God. I don't want your reputation to get messed up among all the peoples of the earth. So, listen, if you find 50 people over there, would you spare them? God says, he's listening to Abraham. Well, okay, if you say, if you find 50, I will. Abraham said, listen, I know I shouldn't be talking like this. I know you're God. But I just want to say this. If we found 40, would you, would you? What about 30? 20, 10, all right, just save Lot. Get him out of body there. Maybe you can't save the rest of them, but Lot's important to me. And God listens to him. That means that God gives us voice and God gives us power. I don't say they're equal. They're not equal, but if they're concerned to him. That is, how can, oh, I'm, I'm so messed up. I'm reading such deep stuff. Touch somebody say, he's messed up. He'll be back. He'll come back. Uh, how, can, how can you have a genuine relationship and you don't share power? I'm just asking a question. How do you have a genuine relationship and share no power? You're in a relationship with somebody, they have all the power, all the decision making, all that. That's what you got at work right now, right? You don't call it a relationship, you call it a job, right? You're in a relationship, you share power. God shares power with us. That means that our decisions are important, and then he responds to those. He's able to go back and forth in an ongoing dynamic relationship with us. And so that leaves us with the fact that we need to understand the Holy Spirit will help us sift through and appraise various things. We've got to get discernment. We've got to learn how that, how because you acted a certain way yesterday don't mean that's the way you need to act today. Because you talked to a person one way yesterday doesn't mean that you need to do the same thing. You're going to have to discern. 
what's going on, like God discerns us. Accepting the things of the Spirit is a process of spiritual discernment where we sift through, we investigate the mysteries of the cross and other things so that we might come to understand who God is and how to walk with him. We have seen that the wisdom of the cross is the wisdom of God's love and forgiveness that is beyond our human abilities to understand. I think I understand why so many people are messed up today because they got American certainty and not biblical reality. They want to be certain about certain things. I want to be certain about who God is and how he acts and what he's going to do. But if you look at God carefully in the text, he cannot always be anticipated. He moves in unusual ways and strange ways because he's a free moral agent and he doesn't always move the way we think he ought to move. You remember in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, they were having this discussion. I believe it was between the beaver and one of the uh, persons that are there. And they asked, they said, talking about Aslan the lion, is he safe? They said, no, he's not safe, but he's good. God is not safe, but he's good. A lot of y'all want a safe God. You want a God you can control. You want a God that you can say he's going to do this and he's going to do that. But the thing about God is that he is so big, he's so great, he's so free that he might not move exactly like you think he's going to move because he's a free moral agent. So we've touched on some very deep stuff that you can't get out of because while we want certainty, a lot of it's just too deep to really understand. It's confusing. It's complicated. We talked about the negative side of the cross. That's difficult. We've talked about the violence of humanity and Satan. That's difficult. We've barely referenced or touched a little bit on how God might be related to violence. I'm studying that now very deeply and the fact that God often uses agents who are violent and he's not violent but he uses them and when he uses them he gets tied up with them and therefore people begin to think he's violent they misunderstand him and he doesn't want mind becoming attached to them and getting confused with them because he's in relationship with them so after a while we start looking at God like he's them but he's not them simply because he has chosen to be in a relationship and won't abandon them you got some relatives in your family that are messed up and if you're careful because your name is Johnson they think you like all the rest of the Johnsons but you are not but because they're, but you're misunderstood because you have chosen to stay in relationship with them because God has chosen to be in relationship with us he sometimes looks like he's violent and he looks messed up because he's been messing with you God is a good God I'm not preaching about that I'm just mentioning it Terrence Fretheim says in his book uh, what kind of God do we serve? We spend so much time trying to figure out if we believe in God, we forget to figure out what kind of God we believe in. I believe in a, in a compassionate God, a merciful God, a wonderful God, who is always up to his be our, for us, up to want to do his best for us in every situation that takes place, no matter how it turns out. Not because he can't do anything about it, but because he's chosen to give us choice, and because he's chosen to give us choice, he has voluntarily submitted to, uh, to limit his power so you can have some power, limit his choice so you can have some choice, and he won't take it back even when you are messed up all right I'm going on I don't have time for that in the next verse Paul continues his explanation he who is spiritual appraises all things now the contrast is clear the natural person versus the spiritual person the natural person is governed by appetites and passion the spiritual person is governed by the Holy Ghost the Spirit provides our passions and our appetite. Jesus uh, illustrated it uh, wonderfully when he said, uh, as one who lived under the power of the Holy Spirit, I do only those things which please the Father. He said, well, well, Jesus, what do you really want? I mean, what's your passion? What do you want? I do only those things which please the Father. Now, those who are unsaved are operating by their passions and by their... Uh, their wants and their druthers and so we don't care about that but that's where we ought to be so we ought to ask the question I'm gonna get in trouble here I'm sorry but you know um, um, do you want a new car only if it pleases the father I can't even get y'all to say that well looking at me like I ain't saying that you, you, you want a new husband
only effect pleases the Father. We got some work to do, don't we? Now, I'm not preaching into the next chapter, chapter 3, but at least to draw the contrast, let me go get that third person so we can have them all together. 1 Corinthians 3 and 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. The word flesh is sarkinos. It means of the flesh. The Latin word is carneus, which come, and from which we get the word carnal. That's where we, we talk about carnal Christians. It comes from the Latin. And some of the Christians were being governed by their flesh as if they were babies in Christ. Now, that's all right for folks who are newly saved, but it's sad for folks who've been Christians for 20, 30, and 40 years walking around acting like babies oh I'm getting ready to get in trouble here but it's the last Sunday of the year what canst thou do to me I'll be gone I'll be at home you ain't gonna be able to get me on Wednesday night even you can come on watch night but we're gonna be gone after that the writer of the sermon of the Hebrews gives us some excellent truth Hebrews 5 12 in your note for though by this time you ought to be teachers you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to, here goes that word again, do what? Discern good and evil. It's time for you to grow up. You've been saved for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, still acting like a baby. Something is wrong. Time for you to eat meat now, not simply baby food. Before baby food, we used to have the mother would chew the food up and put it into the baby's mouth. That's what y'all come here to do every Sunday and Wednesday, ain't it? Bishop, chew the food for me and put it in my mouth. No, it's time for you to grow up and be able to eat the word of God, and be able to discern and handle some meat. Yeah, what kind of meat? What meat is there out? Uh, the meat ought to be, at some time, you ought to come to understand who God really is, that there are going to be some difficult things that are going to happen in your life. That's me. But that he'll still be there for you. That's me. He still loves you, even though you might not understand. That's me. That you don't, you don't agree with all that he allows in your life, but you made those choices. That's meat. We don't want no meat. We want to blame it all on God. God is in control. We love that. Why? Because if God is in control, then what do I have to do? Absolutely nothing. He's in control. He makes all the choices. He, does, he sets everything up. I don't have to do anything. But if he gives me choice... And he's not omnipotent, but omnicompetent. Then I'm responsible for the choices that I make. And I can use my choice to thwart the will of God because he has chosen it to be so. That puts the responsibility back on us. So it's time for you to grow up. I'm waiting on an amen. Stop being a baby. I get so tired of babies all around me. They're just babies. I mean, you know, so-and-so is talking about me. So what? <laughs> Baby? They don't talk about you. They talked about Jesus. He said if they did it in the green tree, what do you think they're going to do in the dry? So-and-so don't like me. And so what? Do they pay your bills? They got a heaven or hell to put you in? Now, you human. It hurts. You want to be liked by everybody. But it ain't going to take no food off your table or do anything else to you. Grow up. Come to church only when things are going good. Ooh, did you feel that? I'm feeling good, you know. God has been good. Just got my income tax check. I feel good. I think I'll go and praise God. When Babies can praise God only when things are good. Saints can praise him when stuff is messed up. Mature folks understand the genuineness of relationship and that they can operate even when things aren't what they think they ought to be. 
So what we got is three kinds of people, and then I got to go on. We got the sukikos, the natural, the unsaved person. We have the sarkinos, the, 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 the fleshly person, and we have the pneumatikos, the spiritual person. Which one are you? Do you want to go ahead and share that with your neighbor right now? Go ahead and share it quick. Stop! You ain't going to tell the truth no way. You're going to say you're spiritual and driven by every passion you can think of. You just came from Christmas driven by every passion, trying to buy everything you could buy. All right. Back to Paul's explanation of a spiritual person. He who is spiritual appraises or discerns all things. When your life is governed by the Holy Spirit, you can discern not only the mysteries of the cross, but all realities of life through the revelatory ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can discern, you can judge, you can make good decisions about all things. As believers, our hearts are no longer blinded by the God of this world. Thank God for the leading of the Holy Ghost for those of us who walk in the Spirit and who are filled with the Luke and filling of the Holy Spirit. God will give you advice and wisdom on what to do in every situation in your life if you ask him. Now, you don't have to do it, but you have not because you ask not. And you ask to consume it of your own lusts. But if he that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And God would give. You don't have to be around there scrounging, trying to figure out what you need to do when you have the Holy Ghost on your side. Go ahead. I mean, the next time you want a new car, just go ahead and ask the Holy Ghost. Notice how I killed every amen. The next time you're looking at somebody and you think about dating him, ask God real good. Should I date this brother? Should I date this sister? He'll let you know. And then you can go ahead and do what you want to do. It's up to you. It's your choice, but you're asking for wisdom. You'd be wise to use the wisdom. But if you don't want to, that's up to you. And guess what? We used to then scare you there because we got that other, some of y'all got that other God. So if you don't do what God tells you to do, he's going to kill you. My God ain't going to kill me. He's going to walk right alongside of me and keep trying to work it out. Now, sometimes I just want you to know he will stop talking to me because I ain't listening. Anybody ever experienced that? He just stopped talking because I ain't listening no way. It's like that GPS. My GPS will stop talking to you. I don't know what happens. What, what it, 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 make a legal U-turn at the next corner. I don't make a legal U-turn. I said, well, I don't hear nothing. I, thought, I think it's gone, but then about five minutes later, it'll say, make a legal U-turn at the next corner. I ain't making no legal U-turn. I'm, I'm going to keep on going. Y'all know how y'all are. You know, I, I tend to listen to the GPS because I think it knows what it's, where it's going. It's up on high, and it's looking down through, cam through the uh, computers and telescopes and can get you where you need. It might not go the way I want to go, but it can get me there. But then there are those of you who think you know where you're going, and so you're going you to go, what, why y what's wrong? What's wrong? You're going to go your own. I don't care what that GPS says. I mean, don't, don't do that. Make it right here. I know where I'm going. So it'll stop talking to you. But know that that GPS keeps coming back. It keeps trying to get you on the right track. And that's just a machine. Think about God. He keeps trying to get you on the right track. A year or two later, you've been walking away from God. God will just, just bump you a little bit and say, okay, I'm still trying to work with you now. I'm trying to, trying to get you back over here, trying to get you in the right lane now. And even though the spiritual man wisely discerns all things, yet he or she is discerned or judged by no one. Did you get that? The spiritual person does not accept the judgment or rejection of people who are sukikos or sarkinos. Ruled by the flesh or ruled by carnality. Because they are governed by their appetites, passions, and fleshly carnality. I, can, I, can I make a big statement? Is anybody here? Who, who, who here? I mean, who is anybody? Can I make a big statement? 
Don't listen to passion-driven fleshly people who are improperly discerning reality. We got more problems today because we don't know who's spiritual. And therefore, we listen to folk who are fleshly, unsaved, carnal, who are saved acting like babies, and allow them to speak their reality into our lives. I'm going to preach if I got to run. I'm sorry, I can't run if I got to hop. Think about it. You can't get good advice today, number one, because you don't know who's spiritual. Number two, you keep going to the wrong people. And you listen to what they tell you because you ain't spiritual. Mm. Somebody tell you, you know, my husband's cheating on me. Go get some advice. They say, well, just cheat on him back, you know. That's the saints. It ain't the world. It ain't the world. That's the saints. Giving their fleshly carnal advice of reality into your life. They don't tell you anything about what Jesus would say. They don't tell you anything about God's suffering. They don't tell you anything about Jesus' suffering. They don't tell you anything about maybe you might need to suffer. Notice, look, you ain't getting no amens right now, is we? Why? Because we don't understand what's happened, that we are driven by that kind of stuff, and that's a scandal in itself. Spiritual people actually look foolish. Because they are guided by the wisdom of God. If you are guided by the wisdom of God, you're not going to give advice and everybody think it's wonderful. They actually think you're kind of stupid. Why would you be, why would you hang around and let somebody misuse you? Why, that's stupid. It is stupid compared to the world. But unsaved and carnal people look intellectually smart and clever because they are guided by the cultural foolishness and weakness which is familiar with people of this age. So when they tell you certain things, you feel it like, oh yeah, I can, I can go along with that because you know I think they are right because I don't think I'll, I should let nobody use me. It walks right down your alley, walks right down with the world that you live in and what's going on. So, it's foolishness to those who are of the world when we start talking the wisdom of God. And so Paul ends this teaching of the scandal of the cross. He lets us know, first of all, mm, glory to God, that we have the mind of Christ. He didn't say the mind of the devil. You got the mind of Christ. If you would apply the mind that the Holy Ghost has given you to every situation in your life, what a change it would make. When I'm at the grocery store, the mind of Christ. When I'm driving home, the mind of Christ. When I'm facing trial, the mind of Christ. When I'm going through stuff, the mind of Christ. Not the mind of the world, not the mind of the devil, not the mind of the unsaved, not the mind of the colonel, but the mind of Christ will help you to walk through those things and to stay in dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, before we leave this subject, allow me to remind you where we began, which was pointing out the contraries, the antitheses, the opposites of the cross, folly versus the power of God, those who are perishing versus those who are being saved, the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the world versus the folly of the gospel, Jews who seek signs, as opposed to those who are called. Greeks who seek wisdom as opposed to the wisdom that is in God. The foolishness of God versus the wisdom of human beings. The weakness of God versus the strength of human beings. The wise by the standards of the world versus the foolishness chosen by God. Powerful and strong versus weak chosen by God. Nobly born versus those who are low and despised. Aren't you glad God uses messed up stuff to confound those who are wise and high born? 
Things that are versus things that are not. Pro proclamation uh, in lofty words of wisdom versus knowing Jesus Christ and him only crucified. Plausible words of wisdom versus the speech and preaching of Paul. Plausible words of wisdom versus the demonstration of the pneuma, the power and the dynamis of God. Human wisdom versus the power of God. All of these contrasts, you need to understand that if, you do, if you're not operating by the Holy Ghost, you're going to be fooled. And the worldly wise who are foolish are audacious enough to think that they know the mind of Christ and that they can even instruct Jesus Christ. Listen to some of the conversation of intelligent and clever people around you who are not saved. They believe they understand things better than God and would presume to instruct God. They wonder why God would choose the foolishness of the cross and put forward their personal suggestion about how God could have achieved a better world and a better salvation without the cost of the cross. Of course, they have no understanding of the mystery of relationship or the relationality of God. If God is fundamentally a relational God, any attempt to understand him demands serious attention to his relationality. The reason you don't understand God is because he ain't operating like human people or like a man. America, but uh, but I like a God who is in dynamic relationship with us whom he loves I don't know about you but I'm so glad he loves me and I'm trying to learn how to love him we learned last week I think it was not that we love God but that he loved us and gave his life a ransom for us. He loved me so much that he came down through, the, 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 the Baptist folks would say, 40 and two generations. He loved me so much that he gave his life. He loved me so much that he gave up heaven so that I might be set free. He loves me so much that he deigns to suffer for me. Now, I know you don't know anything about a suffering God because you think that when God makes decisions that he's all powerful and all controlling, there's nothing to suffer. But when he gives you a choice, he suffers you making a choice that might reject him. And then he takes what you've done and brings it inside of himself and suffers it so that he can continue to work with you and to walk with you in the midst of whatever is going on. He is a loving God. He is a prayer answering God. He's a mighty God. Hallelujah. It's in Psalm, I believe, I mean Exodus 34. I don't think I can find it, but, but I'm going to go here. And I want to find it because sometimes we get these pictures of God in the Old Testament and they're discontinuous with the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. We'd almost split them up. God of the Old Testament, he's messed up and he's, he's vengeful and he's angry. The God of the New Testament, Jesus, he's loving and he's compassionate. But God told you who he was even back in the Old Testament. You just missed it. So I'm going to go there and find it. Exodus 34 and 5, if you don't mind. I, this ain't even in my notes. This just coming out on the top, you know. It's just coming, flowing up from the inside. Exodus 34 and 5 said, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed by in front of them and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps his loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren, the third and fourth generation. Don't miss it. What did he say he was? Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, forgiving. So that's who I am. That's who I am. What kind of God are you serving? That's the God I'm serving. We who are saved are governed by the revelatory power of the Holy Ghost. We have the mind of Christ. You can't see this unless God reveals it to you. You know, I got bad news for you, and then I can go on home. There ain't no shortcuts to understanding God. I said there are no shortcuts. You got to walk with him and talk with him and experience him and get in the word and read the word. 
And Fretheim says, and I'm inclined to agree. To agree. I don't think we, because uh, we're certainty in America, but I'm inclined to agree. The more you know about God, the more mysterious he becomes. Because the more you know about him, the more you find out there is to know about him. How great he is. I, I know I messed up right there. I got, I'm going to take a short detour. I'll be right back. When, you, when you're working with a person and you have a genuine relationship with somebody, the more you know about them, the more there is to know about them. Excuse me. When you have a relationship with somebody, it's a genuine relationship with a genuine person, and y'all have a real relationship when you're working through something, the more you know about them, the more there is to know about them. Because they are so dynamic and such a dynamic creation of God that you could never know all that they are and all that they represent. That's talking about a person. What about God? The more I study him glory, the more I get to know about him, the more enamored I am with him, the more I find out and learn about him, the more mystified I am with him, the more I love him, the more I move into relationship with him, the more I'm blessed by him, the more that I come to know him, the more I want to know him, the more that I come and touch him, the more I want to touch him, the more that I love him, the more I want to love him. It goes sweeter and sweeter every day. Hallelujah. And so I just have to talk about it a little bit because I know some of us, some of us don't know anything about that. Some of us are in marriages where all the sweet is gone. Some of us are in marriages where all the sweet is gone. And so therefore, when people, I don't want to look at nobody, they'll think I'm looking at them. So when people start to talk about how their relationship is so wonderful, whatever, they are skeptical. And they go like this. making me sick. Why are you sick because somebody enjoying their relationship? You could enjoy yours too if you were willing to do what it takes to enjoy it. You don't have to get jealous when I start talking about God and get mad at me because I serve a, a mighty, almighty, righteous and glorious God. You could join me and start praising him too. He's available to you just like he is to me. And he loves you just like he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. But the devil comes along and implants in your mind that he must not love you because of this, that, or the other. The mind of Christ is a scandal in itself. And so it brings us back full circle to the scandal of the cross. The scandal of the cross repels some and draws others. It's foolishness to some, but wisdom to others. Weakness to some, but the power of God to others. Poison to some, but an antidote to others. A sickness to some, but a cure to others. A mystery of the violence of humanity to some, but the mystery of the incredible love of God to others. The scandal of the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Greeks and Americans who are perishing, but the power of God under salvation to those of us who are being saved. Thank you for saving me when I was unsaved. Thank you for revealing to me the scandal of the cross. Thank you for working out stuff for me when no one else could. Thank you for coming for me when everybody else had given up on me. Thank you for giving me three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 different chances. Even though I was messed up, you kept coming back for me over and over again. Thank you that you won't let go of me. No matter how much I protest, no matter how much I pull against you, you won't let go of me. But you keep trying to make a way out of no way. 
so that I could stay in relationship with you. I want to magnify you because you've been so good to me. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. This is the last Sunday of the year. And I think you ought to give him just a little bit of praise that you made it safe this far. Hallelujah. Thus far, the Lord has brought us. Ebenezer, thank God for bringing me safe thus far. Therefore, if I hold my peace, the very rocks are going to cry out. But ain't no rock going to cry out in my place. I got to magnify the God of all creation. Thank you. Thank you for the scandal of the cross, which is revealed in the revelatory ministry of the Holy Ghost. Now is the day of salvation. Come to Jesus now. If you don't know him, I want you to know him. I used to sit in church as a child and as a young man and listen every Sunday as the preacher would say, come now while the blood still runs warm in your veins. And I wasn't paying no attention to that because I was young. I, I couldn't see the fact that tomorrow wasn't promised. And that there are just as many short graves out there as there are long ones. That now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. And you should come while you have this opportunity. For tomorrow is not promised. You have today. And if you want to know him, all you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life, save me. To be, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, it's between you and God. It's a hard transaction. It's not about coming up on the stage. It's not about getting out of your seat. It's not about joining the church. It's about trusting in him. He's not a man that, that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. What he's promised he will do because he's faithful. He's constant in personality, even though changing with respect to interaction with us. If you prayed that prayer in your minute, these are altar workers here. They would certainly like to pray with you. If you need a church home, you can just stand and come forward. They'll deal with you. I want to know if anybody saved here that wants to thank God for making it to 2019 almost. <laughs> Hallelujah. We ought to be praising him for his grace.